Tell us uh, what came out of Davos and start with China for a moment because we did have the Prime Minister go over, Prime Minister Li go over. He was very proud of 5% GDP. Some people are questioning some of those numbers. Uh, what was the discussion at Davos about China and where it stands? So, David, the number is 5.2. Obviously, it looked a little better than what um, the, the estimates had been. But as you said, the numbers are less credible these days. I think the general sense that is coming up from China is very simple. Obviously, you had the biggest delegation, I think, maybe ever from China, certainly bigger than the U.S. delegation this year. Um, but the, uh, the, while the, the language was about we're open for business, in practice, as we know, markets were down 23 percent, outflows, huge outflows last year. Markets are down 10 percent already in China this year. And if you look at uh, both the economic and the social problems that China is facing, things are only unfortunately getting worse. Because if we look, uh, for those of us who've been long-term investors in China, if you look over 20 years, the first 10 years of that 20-year period, China did fairly well. The last 10 years in China, if you were just a regular investor in their equity markets, you were uh, you maybe made a percent or two percent. So when you look at that and you look at the numbers of uh, youth unemployment, those numbers also, by the way, uh, came out. They used to show a 20 some percent uh, youth unemployment number. They stopped putting that number out and they started a new index uh, which shows 14.1, but it excludes college students. That those numbers are showing that student aspirations and young people's aspirations right now in China, those between like 16 to 24, have diminished. China was a country where in the last 20 years there was a lot of hope. So people thought they would do better than, uh, than their parents. They thought by getting a better education, et cetera, more job opportunities, they would do better. Those aspirations, unfortunately, are getting squashed for the uh, for the younger population and then for the urban sort of established mature population the value of the real estate has come down so if we look at the next 10 years while the delegations uh, whether it's this week or a lot of chinese um, delegations are going all over the world right now trying to uh, woo investors as we speak it's hard to be uh, convincing of course valuations are low but what is the trigger to get them up well, what about something you just referred to? Because uh, Prime Minister Li and others within the administration in China have been saying, we're going to be pro-business. We're going to be pro-business. Do we have any sense of actually delivering on that promise? Because as you suggest, Afsani, they've got a big problem with foreign direct investment, which has gone negative, for goodness sakes. I think they are saying they're pro-investments. At the same time, the actions over the last year, especially, were maybe less friendly just to investors in general. A lot of the money that went even into their own local markets was going to the SOEs versus their own private markets. The power of the central bank was getting diminished. So while they're making those statements, in practice, unfortunately, they are being less business friendly because there's less money is going into their own private sector and the fact that central bank is getting more and more directives from the central government. Uh, Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan, while at Davos, says that basically the risk reward has changed dramatically for China. Do you agree with that? Completely. Uh, but also, I just want to say, even though the risk reward was good the last 10 years, China did really well. I'm not sure if investors made as much money. Venture investors made a ton of money early on, but you know, for the companies that are not sold, it's not clear that they would be able to get out of those positions right now. So I think Jamie is very correct in saying the next uh, you know few years, um, a lot would have to change in China in terms of economic policies to make it more interesting to investors, both private and public investors. That's economic policy, which is something that the administration in China can do something about. What about demographics? Because we also got numbers out for demographics, which we're not encouraging. Exactly. And I think uh, the population keeps on getting smaller. And if you have a population that is diminishing in terms of because of the previous policies in terms of children that they had, uh, even though that policy has changed, the issue is that together with the aspiration of young people and the fact that there's this youth unemployment really does not bode very well. And the fact that a lot of Chinese investments um, of households was in real estate, and we know that that sector is hugely down. And 
<laughs> even policies are not going to fix that. And last but not least, a lot of the young people have been getting trained to go into services jobs, jobs that are diminishing also. So all of that, the demographics, but also the composition of the job market that is changing, um, again, is not very positive. I'll say one aspect of the Chinese economy that reportedly is strong and growing has to do with renewable energy, whether it's electric vehicles, or whether it's solar panels or whatever. Uh, what was the discussion at Davos about what used to be called ESG? ESG sort of got a bad name now. Larry Fink says he doesn't want to say that anymore. But whatever you call about it, climate-related investment, what was the discussion? So I think, broadly speaking, um, the, you know, uh, I think World Economic Forum has been doing a number of studies also over the last year on uh, on the ESG topic, uh, and um, and most people, including myself, you know, and people who've been um, in the world of impact investing, do not necessarily like the word ESG. There is a political issue going on with ESG and DI. Putting that aside for a second, just. Basically, I don't think there's a lot of disagreement that there are issues with uh, and risks with uh, climate related issues. Plus, the economics of solar and wind have changed hugely. And today, they are very economic in many parts of the world, whether it's US, whether it's Africa, whether it's Norway, whether it is the rest of Europe. What we're seeing is that there is a China itself, you know, where you're seeing that um, that whether it is EV cars or it's solar panels, they're going to be a cheaper alternative than uh, relying on oil and gas. So the decisions are economic. I think the Chinese obviously are looking at their own um, climate related issues. They're the quality of air, the quality of water, the quality of food that is coming out and is sometimes hazardous. And they are investing a lot in those areas. Plus, that is the one bright spot, um, I would say, in China. Well, and Afsani, as you know so well, in life and in business, what you call something really matters. And go away from ESG or even climate. Talk about infrastructure. Last week, we had this big deal announced with BlackRock and GIP, Bio Evaglacia, you know well, as well as Larry Frank. And, and yes. talking to them about the opportunity they see there in infrastructure, an awful lot of it seems to go back to climate and the investment we need to make to get to net zero. Exactly. And I think while you will see that uh, Larry may not be using those terms and uh, politically very, very careful on the terminology he's using, you can see what he's investing in. And, uh, and I think that is a really positive sign in the sense that infrastructure is getting built. GIP obviously is one of the uh, biggest investors in this area. I think, uh, you know, as uh, one of the, um, my colleagues, one of the ex-World Bank um, presidents also is, uh, is uh, been there as well. And what you see is that, um, that a lot of their portfolio is increasingly investing in energy transition, in uh, bringing power alliance and great expansion of power grids. It's uh, looking at ports and looking at um, at infrastructure with an uh, with a, um, ESG lens. And it's not just GIP, it's not just BlackRock. If you look, look at Prologis, if you look at really any large company investing in infrastructure or logistics, looking at two areas. One is um, clean energy and energy transition in order to reduce costs and uh, increase reliability and reduce risks, and also AI, obviously. And those are getting more and more intertwined. And the uh, interrelationship between AI and clean energy, I think, will be an interesting area to watch.